Hello and welcome. This is the ArcGIS Enterprise Tuning and Scaling Session. My name is Aaron Lopez. I'm a performance analyst with professional services at Esri. And with me is Jeff DeWeese, who's a solution architect, also with professional services at Esri. This session will cover quite a bit of ground on the practical and mechanical aspects of how to tune your system. For example, if you have a published service, what are some things to keep in mind for supporting the most number of users? Many of these strategies are things you can do today with your deployment. However, in one session, we won't be able to cover the full details of everything, all the best practices of uh, layers and service types, for example, real time and big data. They have rightfully their own sessions to take that deeper dive. So with that, we'll start with our session overview. Um, what we'll be covering. We'll cover components of ArcGIS Enterprise, such as ArcGIS Server. Server, this is the primary engine powering everything that's drawn or displayed. Uh, authoring, tuning of services, how to optimize specific services, or optimize your deployment for many services. We'll then have a brief discussion on Portal for ArcGIS, um, some tasks that you can optimize, such as backups. Uh, we'll break down the ArcGIS data store and the various components for uh, storage types. Uh, we'll quickly discuss the ArcGIS web adapter. This is an application for forwarding requests to ArcGIS uh, Enterprise. Um, and then we have the Enterprise Geodatabase. Now the Enterprise Geodatabase is a very rich topic and potential area, area for tuning the software stack. But this is one that requires its own session. Um, however, we will touch briefly on some parts of it. So before we get into the details of tuning, Let's talk about infrastructure. The infrastructure of your deployment is very important and plays a crucial role. Sometimes the available infrastructure is dictated to you. Sometimes you can choose it. But in either case, it can have a big impact. And your infrastructure can take many forms because the environments can vary. You can deploy ArcGIS Enterprise on bare metal, such as a physical machine. You can also go the route to virtualization. In past years, uh, cloud and related services uh, have taken off. And upcoming, we have containers and Kubernetes. But in all of these, ca these cases with your environment, the placement of storage is key. And this is because with ArcGIS Enterprise, you're storing Things such as your configuration store, your server directories like cache, geoprocessing output directories, uh, portal content store. Um, these are important because ArcGIS Enterprise is very reliant on files stored in different directories like a local disk, a NAS device over the network, an S3 bucket. Unreliable storage results in an unreliable ArcGIS Enterprise. So this is very, very important. So now we're going to talk about service fundamentals. Uh, and this starts with tuning individual services. So with that, um, we'll talk about where the services start from. And they start from maps. Um, a desktop map, for example. And typically, desktop maps are often made with a different purpose than the web. And because of that, desktop maps don't always scale for the web. And that's mostly due because they have a different purpose. A desktop map might be for editing or for deeper analysis. The web, on the other hand, is more about how many maps can I serve and how quickly can they be displayed. So think of the web as many users but with limited resources. If you're on your desktop and you're working with your map and it takes five, eight, ten seconds, 
that may not be a concern to you as much uh, as when you're trying to consume that content uh, from the web, from server. Uh, if you're having to wait 10 seconds, what you may wind up doing is click, clicking refresh, reload, which in turn issues another request. And so as we move to the web, that's something to keep in mind. So some strategies that you can use to get the most performance out of your map is to have it focused. Uh, using things like scale dependencies, definition queries, uh, removing unneeded layers or hiding fields that you're not using are great ways to have your map take a focused approach. Using a general map might need all those visible layers and fields, but we can't expect users to turn those off. And so where appropriate, and you can focus that map, uh, you can take advantage of these strategies uh, to ensure better performance. Uh, labeling. Labeling is another example where it can be ex very expen expensive for your placement and using annotations instead can help improve performance. Using the same coordinate system in your data frame as your data, while technically fine if they don't match up, um, this can also incur a performance penalty. So it's highly recommended for your data frame and data to be the same. An advanced user tip um, that we recommend people take advantage of in ArcGIS server is the cache control max age. This property allows the client connecting um, to not make a full request to server and instead can specify a time where it can reference its own local copy. So this can help avoid an entire trip from client to server and can save on precious computing cycles and allow your deployment to scale better. So now let's talk about some general data considerations as we uh, look at our services. So matching the resolution of a feature class to the accuracy of your data is a great strategy. If your data is only at a meter, there's no need for using something like a millimeter resolution. It's, it's wasted, but the software stack is still sending that precision along with it, with every request, and it's unneeded. Indexing a file or enterprise geodatabase appropriately is also a great strategy uh, for getting the best performance possible. For enterprise geodatabases, of course, it's always recommended to maintain statistics for having the best execution plan for your database. Um, using the spatial types um, is also um, recommended. Many databases have several options for spatial types, and so you can work with your DBA to ensure you're using the most optimal one. And the spatial types can help influence how the data is indexed, how fast the spatial extent queries can be made and returned, so it, it can have a big impact on performance. So as we look a little deeper at the geodatabase, um, let's do a quick overview. Enterprise geodatabase data is fast. Under the, assum the assumption you're keeping your statistics up to date and indexes on the fields that you're querying. In the past, historically, we had versioning, which we're now referencing as traditional versioning. This was fine for desktop editing, but as you move to the web, it became much more complicated Versioning queries are expensive using the traditional versioning model. And if you have to use data in this fashion, it's recommended to access non-version layers whenever possible. But in order to improve upon this, branch versioning was recently developed with Pro and Enterprise. So this was a design for many concurrent users and the web. It uses a simpler table structure. No more adds or deletes, no state tree, no state lineage tables. This is a time-based design instead of using tables and IDs to track changes. 
This architecture moves editing logic from the web and does away with the direct connection to the database. An example of branch versioning is the popular utility network. So alternatively, you could take a look at file-based data, a file ge geodatabase, for example. Very optimized, performs best when kept local to the server. It's best with static data, not data that's being um, has a need to be edited frequently. And if you can make your data source read-only, you can gain some performance as a write lock is not needed to be created um, for editing. The file geodatabase performs much better than shapefiles, which used to be a popular format. Scalability is also greater than shapefiles with the file geodatabase. Service models. So before we get into the discussion of service models, let's have a discussion on the life cycle of a traditional, dynamic, and dedicated service. <coughs> so in this case, we're looking at this diagram. We're the user up at the top. We make an anonymous request for our map service. This request enters the stack through the web adapter. The web adapter, in turn, looks for an available ArcGIS server. Upon finding the ArcGIS server, the appropriate service handler, in this example, REST, responds to that request and finds the appropriate map service. So now, the service handler, upon finding the map service, checks the service to see if there is a free instance of that service. If a free ARC SOC is found, it begins working on that request and returns the appropriate data back to the user. However, if the service is busy, after a specified wait timeout, an error would be returned back to the user. So this is important because getting your data with this all, is all dependent on there being a free instance at any one time. And so it's an important to summarize that a single service instance can only handle one request at a time. So now that we understand the life cycle in the dedicated model, we can compare that and list that with the other, other models. So we have a total of three. We have a dedicated or traditional service model. <clears throat> and this is good for fine tuning each service. Has the concept of a service instance, otherwise known as an ARC SOC. And this is with user managed data and server side rendering. We also have hosted. This is an auto-managed or ArcGIS server managed data. And thirdly, we have um, recently a shared service type. This is also ArcSoc based, also user managed data. And it's a new way of providing a group of instances available for various services. So now let's look at the dedicated services a little closer. With the dedicated service, you have some properties. These properties uh, dictate the number of service instances that can be running. You have the memory usage at rest, that's the minimum setting. And then you have the concurrent request to be serviced, that's the maximum. If the maximum is not set high enough, a wait time can incur while the user waits to get access to that instance. So this becomes um, a common goal of administrators using a dedicated service. And that's to find a balance between the number of dedicated dynamic services and available system resources. Setting too low a setting can incur a startup cost. 
And if it's too high, you can waste resources unnecessarily. So as you try to find which services are the most popular and their current performance profiles, there are some tools that can help. System Log Parser, which is a utility that you can point at your logs for log analysis, as well as ArcGIS Server Statistics, can help you quantify GIS usage of your deployment. So where would you adjust the minimum and maximum? Well, in the dedicated services, you can log into ArcGIS Manager, look at the pooling tab, and there you can set your min and maximum instances for that service. But it's recommended to do for all your services. The default is a minimum of one and two, but every service is different, every deployment is different. Your needs will be different. Cache services, on the other hand, can get by with a maximum of one to conserve memory. And this is an important note that such requests are not serviced by an ArcSoc process. So as you adjust your minimum and maximum, especially your maximum, it's important to try to avoid overload. Remember, a single service instance can only handle one request at a time. But also, avoiding overallocation is important too. A deployment has only so much CPU and memory available, and increasing the maximum instances is limited by the underlying infrastructure available. Another important distinction is that concurrent users is not the same as concurrent requests. Having one user on the system isn't constantly issuing requests to your system. A user may make a request, get content back, and then analyze the data themselves before issuing another request. So the classic question or challenge that administrators have is, well, what, does, what is my deployment made of? Is it many services with low to moderate popularity? or a few services with high popularity, or a mixture of both. For services that have the low to moderate popularity, a minimum of zero has historically been a popular choice for these seldomly used services. However, the new shared service type is the path recommended going forward. Hosted services. Now, hosted services are a little different than de dedicated services. They don't utilize a service instance, which is the ArcSoc process. They're highly scalable. Their data is returned as JSON or PBF. As they favor, instead of a server-side rendering, they favor a client-side rendering. Their data resides in the relational data store, which is managed by ArcGIS. An important note is that with hosted, hosted request will not have an ArcGIS server log entry. However, if the ArcGIS web adapter is available, that request could be found in the web log of IIS, for example. Now this brings us to shared services. This was introduced at 10.7 and has been a game changer mostly because it helps reduce the memory footprint in huge ways by providing a group of instances that are always available for these seldom used or moderately used services. With a shared instance pool, you can put these services here and, and don't have to manually configure or routinely configure services that are seldom used. This requires services to be published, published through ArcGIS Pro, and not all service types are available. So now let's look at an example of how you can take advantage of shared, a shared instance type versus a dedicated instance type to save memory. In the box up at the top, we have seven services, 
and one network analyst service. Here we have our maximum instances set to one and our network analyst set to two. So at most we have eight instances. However, each of the regular map services can only service one concurrent request at a time. Alternatively, with the shared design, we can group the majority of our services um, and save on memory, but also allow for increased scalability. This takes our number of concurrent instances from eight to six, but if our Los Angeles map service has an influx of simultaneous requests, the shared service type will have the ability to respond to those new requests without limiting our scalability. One takeaway with this approach is usage patterns of your deployment will often change. So as you monitor your site, adjust the instance type settings as you see fit based on traffic and server performance. With a shared type service, a lot of this can go away and for the seldom used services, you can allow this to help take advantage of memory savings and lower your, your cost of administration. Tuning. Well, we'll look at tuning from the point of view of a map, a web map. So with hosted feature service, there are some considerations. Read-only feature service, smaller and faster, than editable, editable data. And the reason is because editing preserves the resolution and precision. However, by default, hosted feature services are published in read-only mode, which is good. However, if you find that you do in fact need editing, you can utilize feature layer views, whereas viewers still get the fast presentation of the data, but editors still get access to the full data to make changes. A good strategy is also to reduce your clicks. Your first view of your web map should be the most performing, as all users connecting to your web map will connect and experience what that presents. Reducing clicks, um, having the default extent perform well is a great strategy. In areas where you have complex data, utilizing cache tiles can help reduce demand on your, re your limited system resources as well as traffic if those cache tiles are coming from an external resource such as ArcGIS Online. Large amounts of data, feature service data, um, can be slow. So it's recommended to use aggregated data um, with smart mapping, for instance, uh, a heat map. New releases of enterprise utilize the on-the-fly quantization, which is a new way of doing generalization, which is smaller data transfers. You're not sending the full raw data. So now let's look at another example. Here we have a deployment with one data set and three ArcGIS server services. Each service, service, which could be representing a separate layer, has its own definition query and is consuming memory. A web layer is then created for each of these services. The web layers in turn can be added to the desired map. Now this is technically fine and functional, but now let's consider the following. By taking advantage of the portal geo information model, we can move those layers directly into the portal level and have the de definition query exist there instead. In many cases, this is a much more efficient approach. We still have our data source in the data store, which is our Wells data in this example, one GIS service, which is Wells, and then in our enterprise portal, we can present the active wells layer, our proposed wells layer, and our wells by status layer. This is 
uh, a more optimal way, an efficient way of doing this. But keep in mind, this is not applicable for every scenario. Where the strategy may not fit is if security has a specific requirement, as currently security is done at the service level. So portal for ArcGIS. Portal for ArcGIS has a few items which can affect performance worth discussing. And they pertain to logging in and backups. Identity and group stores can affect login performance where your Active Directory contains many users and many groups. Although this is something only administrators can add, it's important to keep in mind. Um, this was uh, had a greater impact on older releases and has improved now, but still something uh, to keep in mind. Backups. Well, choosing the right combination of full and incre incremental is a good strategy. Um, a good starting point would be for your full to incremental ratio is one in six. One full backup for every six incrementals is a good place to start. Uh, backup cadence can also impact performance, and it's recommended to run backups during off hours. So before we discuss the ArcGIS data store, um, a quick word about the ArcGIS web adapter is well deserved. For most cases, the ArcGIS web adapter application scales quite well out of the box. Uh, the only thing that we would add is that for the best performance, it's recommended to use a separate instance when installing ArcGIS server and portal when installing on the same machine. Now, tuning to the, turning to the ArcGIS data store, by design there is not much tuning available with the ArcGIS data store, as it is managed by ArcGIS. But it is worth discussing the types of data you have available. You have a relational data store. This stores the data for the hosted feature layers. This resides in a Postgres database. You also have a tile cache data store, and this is used to support things like 3D layers, 3D scene layers, and related services. And this resides in a couch DB. Lastly, you have the choice of a spatio-temporal big data store. This is used for things like geo event server and geo analytics server. So, although there's not much tuning for the ArcGIS data store, there are some management things you can do. Uh, there are many command line tools for managing your ArcGIS data store available from the ArcGIS data store command line utility reference online. And there's uh, many, many tools there for getting insight onto your current machine's deployment and configuration. And with that, uh, Jeff Deweese will talk uh, about scaling. All right, thank you, Aaron. Yes, yeah, so Aaron's been focused a lot on the application side and the configuration of ArcGIS server and the components. I'm gonna take it down um, below that a little bit down to the infrastructure level and talk about a few things that are important in terms of scaling the infrastructure to make sure that you can keep your performance as optimized as possible and to think about different strategies, how to scale it as your site gets busier, as you add users, et cetera. So one of the first things to think about is this concept of scaling up or scaling out. So scaling up has to do with adding resources to existing machines. So for example, CPU and memory. When you add CPU, you're essentially allowing your system to uh, support increased throughput. So I just add more CPUs, I can, I can support more transactions, more users. Uh, when we talk about adding, adding memory to existing servers, that strategy is more related to supporting an increased number of services instances. So as your services grow, you're going to find you're going to need more memory on those, on those servers. Um, another way to approach this is what we call scaling out, where 
you add boxes or servers to, to your deployment. And that allows you to manage capacity by adding more servers. And those servers are generally, you know, of like um, specifications in terms of cores and memory. So both those strategy, strategies can be used together. You know, you can scale up to a reasonable point and then scale out. That's often what a lot of folks do. And, you know, there's not one answer. It really, there's a lot of variables that go into this. This is really just to make you aware of the different strategies and, and why you might use them and why you might not. And that's what I'm going to talk about here in a second. So thinking about the different constraints related to scaling up, you can't really scale up forever, right? You can't just take a box and put infinite resources on it to adapt to your growing load. Um, a box like with 16 cores and 64 gig of RAM is a pretty hefty box. That, that's on the larger side that we see. Sometimes we see more memory for certain cases like big raster analytics deployments. You might see 128, but um, and in some cases maybe even more cores, but those are niche cases. So the idea is just be, be cognizant of that where, you, again, you can scale up to a certain point and you need to scale out. And there's other things like, remember, you need, to, you need at least two servers to support high availability. So that forces you more a little bit into the, the scale out mode to, to at least be able to support your high availability. Also, large servers can lead to large capacity reduction when, when a server becomes unavailable. And that's what the graphic is trying to show, where if, if you put everything into just a couple servers, if you lose one of those servers, you've just lost 50% of your overall capacity. And that could have a marked um, effect when, you know, if you're in the busy season, you've got a lot of usage on your site and you lose 50% capacity, you could essentially lose your whole site because it comes, becomes overwhelmed with the, uh, lo the load that's being applied to it. Versus if you moderated that a little bit and spread the load out across four servers with half the half the resources, if you lost one of those servers, you'd only lose 25% of your capacity. So the surviving three servers would be in a better position to maintain the load. Yeah, you might get some slowdown if, if they were near, you know, peaked out to begin with, but chances are you would survive uh, without crashing uh, versus that first scenario. So something to consider there. Um, Scaling out constraints, you got to think about some of these items like portal high availability is limited to two servers. You can't build currently a portal HA deployment with more than two servers. And that those would be in an active, active mode. Uh, the relational data store is also limited to two servers, active, passive. GS server sites are highly scalable, but again, there are practical limits um, we've seen sites that are maybe, I, I believe I've seen some that are up to 10 hosts in a site, but um, not 30 or 40 or 50. Um, there, there's practical limits there. So you've got to keep these things in mind. Geoanalytics server supports one and three server site configurations only, so you're restricted there. GeoEvent server can be challenging to scale out to build, uh, to build an HA GeoEvent um, and more servers equals more Windows Server licensing. So even think about licensing considerations. And more servers, of course, equals more administration. So again, this, this allows you to balance out how far you scale out versus how far you scale up. So you want to scale up to a degree and then start to scale out, but keep these constraints in mind. Another characteristic related to scaling is how you tier architectures. Um, and you've probably heard, like, heard of these terms like single tier, two tier, three tier. So for a single tier deployment, meaning essentially all the ArcGIS Enterprise components are installed on a single server, which the diagram is showing. This is used usually for small deployments, you know, 10 or less users, for example, a proof of concept or supporting a targeted function, such as raster analytics, where the portal itself is not being utilized a lot, but functions that it's supporting are being heavily used. 
Um, in this case, the portal, web adapter, hosting server, and relational data store are all on one server. Uh, again, just be careful with using this in production for, um, for, for anything other than what's mentioned here in these use cases. The next step to this is to tier the architecture where we have two tiers now. We essentially have established a web tier and a combined app slash data tier. Um, this is the use case here is where deployments for deployments where the hosting function is not dominant. You're maybe doing a little some limited amount of hosting services, but you don't have 500 services supporting you know tens of applications. Um, and you don't have a lot of load on that data store. And you, know, you might be thinking, well, isn't it a bad idea to put a data component mixed with an app server component? Because, you know, if it's a DBMS, we always recommend that to be on its own tier. The data store is a little unique because it is managed by ArcGIS server. The only client to it is the hosting server, so you don't have multiple clients externally trying to connect to it. The only client is that hosting server. Uh, so we have a little bit more leverage about co-hosting these components together. Uh, so in this case, you'd have a web tier with portal and web adapters, and then an app tier with the hosting server and the relational data store together. And this, and this is a pretty common practice. Now to take it one step further, if you do need a fully tiered solution. In that case, it's where the hosting function is fairly dominant. You have a large number of hosted services you're supporting. Uh, you're using spatial anal analysis tools and supporting um, applications such as Insights for ArcGIS, which puts, can put a heavy load on that data store. That's where we want to start to see this separated out. And there may be other drivers for this. Maybe your IT department prefers fully tiered architectures. So there's different drivers of why you may end up in this, in this kind of configuration. But again, we're also, of course, looking at this from the scalability perspective. Uh, this, this will give you the, I guess, the absolute amount, total amount of leverage to allow you to scale each tier as much as possible. Um, where that data store, again, even though single box or two boxes for HA, that's as far as you can scale out, but you can scale them up as needed by adding resources. The GIS server tier, you can add multiple servers to that tier and so on. So in this config, you have the portal plus web adapters at the web tier, the hosting GIS server at the app tier, and the relational data store at the data tier. And beyond this, th these are just examples that web that tier at the top can even be uh, tiered further where you can actually have a separate web tier with just the web adapters. And that's actually quite common. And the portal is a standalone server because that web tier actually may be supporting multiple GIS server sites in the portal. So these are a bit conceptual diagrams, but uh, to make the point about scaling, but they don't, re they don't represent the only options for um, architecting the solution. And I'll have some more examples of that here in a second. So thinking about another aspect for scalability is workload separation. And when we, what we mean by that is literally breaking up that workload, the GIS workflow workloads, in, into buckets such as data management, analysis, and visualization. Those are kind of the, the rough dividers. This allows you to maximize your performance and scalability by not just mixing everything together, all, all these different types of processing. You know, you don't really want to mix geoprocessing with, with visualization because that heavy geoprocessing is going to interfere quite often with that visualization. You, you don't want a person just that's trying to view maps to pay a penalty because because three, or three out of the four processes are, are busy doing geoprocessing on that server. Um, and this, of course, designing the system in this way helps reduce the risk of service interruption for, you know, based on that example I just provided. For, um, it also allows you to align with licensing strategies. You may have certain extensions and roles that you want to isolate onto their own server site so that you don't have to license all the server, all the GIS servers the same way. 
and it allows for effective monitoring and troubleshooting. You know, imagine if you had uh, various 50 different services that are image and map and feature and, and uh, geometric net or, or uh, utility network. Uh, all these different service types are running and you have a problem. It's like, where do you start? How do you troubleshoot? How do you effectively monitor? Where, if these different functions are isolated, uh, it'll, it'll allow you to monitor those server sites independently and track that problem down much easier. So how do we decide how to separate, uh, do workload separation essentially? We do this generally by GIS server roles. So we have different licensing roles. Uh, you know, a, a GI, just a plain GIS server, which is often deployed as a, a mapping site doing your, that's hosting most of your general map services. If you have imagery you're, you're hosting, you'll, the idea there would likely be deployed on its own image server, event processing on a geo event server, geo analytics on a geo analytics server. Um, there's business analytics or excuse me, business analyst server and notebook server as well. So, and then there's other roles that are, aren't really licensing roles, but they're roles that generally are separated, like a hosting server, a geoprocessing slash printing server, and I mentioned earlier about the utility network. We generally recommend separating that onto its own site for those reasons I previously mentioned. So let's look at an example of what this might look like for, a, I'd say, a medium-sized deployment. In here, we do have a separate web tier, like I mentioned. This is designed for high availability, redundant components. And we have four sites. We have a hosting site, a mapping site, a utility network site, and an imagery site. And those are encapsulated by the red box drawn here. So you can see how we separated those functions out so that, again, we can distribute the load through the web adapters to the different sites based on the different service type requests that are coming in. And we can, we can um, scale those sites independently. We may find that the mapping site, we need three hosts in, where the image site, maybe we only need two hosts and so on. And maybe the geoprocessing site, we need five hosts. So we can tune each one of those by scaling um, based on their specific needs. And finally, a larger and real deployment. This is actually from a real case study. This large deployment has 11 GIS server sites. Um, same concept, web tier, managing all the web adapters. In this case, ArcGIS Enterprise on that upper left was isolated. Um, but down below are all the other GIS server sites. So in this one, we had a hosting site, an imagery site, three viewer sites, a geoprocessing site. ArcFM was part of this deployment because it's a utility deployment. Um, they have a, there was a, web, a, a GIS site for the web app, for the mobile a mapping site, a street map site, and utility network site. So you can, you can imagine if you tried to put all this workload on one massive site, because you, you could say, well, I'll just build a 15-server you know, site and just run everything together. Um, yeah, that's definitely not a recommended practice. We want to isolate based on that workload. And with that, that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.